several of our members are um, having to get to other meetings, so give them a five-minute uh, break to dart out the door if they need to. So that, that's what uh, it didn't apply to legislators, which is why I'm having to explain this today. So. Uh, yes, I was a high school teacher, but that that's <laughs> irrelevant to what, what's going on. Um, I've got reports. We'll begin with uh, Representative Riley's report. What number? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Your Committee on Environmental Quality met on Tuesday, February 19th, and we heard House Bill 199. Majority Whip Edward Lindsay offered an amendment to the bill, and the amendment was accepted. After further discussion, the bill was passed as a committee substitute as amended, and that concludes my report. Thank you. And then we also have a report, we also have a report from Representative Hardin and 21. 21. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Your subcommittee on resource management met, met yesterday, February 20th. We heard House Bills 226, 276, and 320. And the subcommittee unanimously passed House Bill 226 as a committee substitute as amended, and also passed House Bill 320 as a com committee substitute by a vote of 6 to 1. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our subcommittee report. So we'll move right on to the legislation before the committee today. And we'll start with uh, Majority Whip Lindsay for House Bill 199. Just come to the chairs. Morning. Morning. I bring, I bring before you today House Bill 199. Um, for those of you who are in the subcommittee, you heard my little opening before, but I think it bears repeating. Uh, as I'm sure most of you have also had constituents ask, should we focus on, on conservation or capacity when it comes to water supply? And my answer is always yes. Uh, we need to focus on both. And what this bill simply does is it gives uh, GFA a uh, greater flexibility to concentrate both on capacity and conservation. What the bill will simply allow for is for GFA uh, to not only uh, use its bonding authority to help uh, build reservoirs, which are desperately needed in this state, but also to assist uh, local water suppliers uh, with uh, the necessary technology to uh, be able to detect uh, leakages and, and broken pipes and that sort of thing and to be able to fix those much more rapidly so that we don't lose this very valuable asset that we have in our state. That's essentially what the bill does, Madam Chair. Uh, we work very closely with experts in the water supply area as well as GIFA on the language and I appreciate GIFA's efforts uh, to assist us in drafting this legislation and crafting it in a way that fits within their mandate. I would also like to add that uh, this bill is purely discretionary uh, in terms of the allocation of the funds uh, by GFA. It doesn't mandate anything. It just simply allows them greater flexibility, which is something we desperately need uh, when it comes to the issue of water supply. Uh, and it should also uh, need to point out that it will not have an impact on the governor's already existing water supply program. That's essentially the bill, Madam Chair. Thank you. Chair will entertain questions. At the proper time, I'll entertain a motion. Yes, just push a button. Number 23. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I move to pass the committee substitute. I have a, a motion do pass and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Thank Congratulations. You. you have a bill. Appreciate your help. Good luck in rule. <laughs> <laughs> we can all use good luck. We can. <laughs> um, I'm going to ask Representative Hardin to go ahead and present his bill now, and that's number 21. I probably have to leave this meeting at about 10 till, so I wanted to go ahead and give Representative Hardin a chance to present his bill because I might have to leave. Thank you. So, excuse me, it's House Bill 320. House Bill 320, we're working off of LC 40319S, the committee substitute. Uh, <coughs> Madam Chair, this, this bill uh, pertains to inert waste landfill operations, and 
it w is proposed in response to some <coughs> new regulations that were imposed by the uh, EPD, the Department of Natural Resources, uh, in order to allow existing inert landfills who are operating in compliance with the rules at the time they were licensed to continue to operate under those rules. Um, <coughs> there was also a section added that will not make it a, a crime for uh, a agricultural person to basically bury small amounts of inert waste on their on their own land. Uh, there is a buffer on that to satisfy that requirement. I don't think that there are any other any other pertinent information, but I would be willing to answer any questions the committee might have. Thank you. You do have a couple of questions. Um, and I'm going to try and just go from left to right with this. So number 16, if you give your name and ask your question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Brian Thomas. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, we heard testimony uh, yesterday in subcommittee from a gentleman from EPD who indicated that there are about 118, I think was the number of inert landfills in the state currently. and only 77 of them are actually complying with the annual requirement to report the tonnage of materials placed in that landfill. Am I remembering that correctly? Uh, the number of inert landfills uh, under the definition currently uh, was 1,018. 1,018, right. <coughs> but that it does include uh, sites where construction uh, debris has been buried in residential areas, and, and we're looking at another effort to uh, to control that type of thing which would not be allowed even under the, these this bill the only thing we are doing is grandfathering in basically those people who got a permit and are operating under that permit the bill requires those folks to get a professional engineer to certify that they are in fact operating under the current rules and regulations but under the uh, my question is uh, under the you, uh, you? yes Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my question is that to be operating under the current permit, the only requirement, from my understanding, is to be submitting an annual report of what tonnage is entering into that landfill, and only 77 people are currently even complying with those rules. So, so why do we want to grandfather everybody in? I guess that well, since they're they clearly not complying, we only grandfather in those people who come into compliance, total compliance with those rules by January uh, 2014. The new rules actually give anybody who wants to comply with the new rules 18 months to come into compliance with the new rules. So I, there is a time period there in which you can prove that you are operating in, in the correct manner and can then be grandfathered in under the rules that you got your permit from. Will the gentleman yield for one further Sorry. question? So for those people that do meet that requirement, what future requirements will they have? They will have the same future requirements of the permit by rule. And I don't have a list of those uh, rules right now, but that's those, those are the rules that they obtain their permit under, and they will be bound to those rules, the ones that existed as of January 1st, 2012. Thank you. Thank you. Um, number 24. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Rob Zimhardt, I first apologize for not being in the subcommittee, but this is a um, one of the biggest issues in my district. I have an inert facility that's the number one problem in the state of Georgia, and I, I just want to know, it says the engineer, a licensed engineer, will determine if they're in compliance. Mm -hmm. Does EPD have any role in determining if they're in compliance? Because I know there's some private engineers that may lean one way or the other. Yeah. Ab absolutely, uh, Representative Gasway. The, the EPD, in fact, that was the reason for the addition of the certification by a professional engineer. The, the new rules require that a professional engineer basically re-engineer the, the entire field. So by adding this, we are we basically did this to help the department. The department does not have the manpower to to enforce the rules that are in effect uh, now or the ones in the future, and that's the reason for putting the private professional engineer in a position to to certify to the department. Would you yield for one more question? Certainly. 
Are any of these engineers going to be qualified by the EPD, or will they be picked by the, the institution that's being regulated? I think uh, basically since we added that for the for the EPD, that that will be up to them, and I I would be you know satisfied either way that goes. If if they wish to certify the engineer to certify the, then that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. And and for the members of our committee, especially our new committee members, uh, a lot of us have uh, dug our way into the solid waste management land management part of our code section, and it takes years to get up to where we are, and we're still not up to any high level, so to speak. But there are three categories. There's inert, which is permit by rule. Then we have another one called C and D landfill, stands for con construction and demolition. And then the third one, solid waste landfills, we shortcut that name by saying munis. And so it's a huge, huge, huge category. Um, you might have a C and D landfill. I'm not not sure. You, you, you have an inert? Inert? Okay. Both on the same side. So you have dual yeah. problems. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, let's see. Thank you, sir. Number 26. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have two questions, if you'll yield to me. Uh, first, I want to thank you for bringing this forward. I actually, with Senator Gooch, had met with EPD on this issue because we have an inert landfill in our community that does perform well and is in compliance, but the new rules was going to be very uh, difficult for them, and they'd probably shut down. It's a difficult time to lose these small businesses. Uh, but I think Madam Chair may have answered my first question. My understanding of the small landfills, inert landfills, is there's not necessarily a permit, but it's a, you report that you have one and you're permitted by report. Uh, is, is that correct? That is basically correct. As I say, I'm not sure what other rules the, the department has in, you know, in place, but uh, that all we are saying in the bill is those landfills must meet the rules that the department has in place under which they obtain their permit. So uh, and I, that answered my question, I think. So if, if that is the case and they did report and they currently are in compliance, then they'll continue to be in compliance. So second part of that question was, um, if I've got a landfill in my community that's in compliance with the current rules that existed before the DNR board made the change, they would continue to be able to operate. The only thing they would have to do would get a civil engineer uh, who was qualified by EPD to say that they were in compliance with the existing rules. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, thank you. Um, I have one question to ask you as well before we get to our next questions. And um, there was a list of, um, for the permit by rule, tonnage was one of the requirements. There are several on that checkoff yeah. sheet that have to be met, but the reporting was, I think, the tonnage. So there is a list of about 10 checkoffs, and um, we can... We have uh, the GFA director here if you need to ask him to help you with any clarification. Right. Well, it, yeah, and if the committee would like a, a list of those, and that would be uh, appropriate. Thank you. Um, number 16. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to clarify. I mean, EPD uh, has new rules for inert landfills, correct? That were just, just passed. Uh, correct. Passed, I believe, on January 23rd of this year. And those rules have replaced the old rules. Previously, you could get uh, an inert landfill with a permit by rule process that no longer exists because th those rules have been they've, they've been dumped in, in exchange for the new rules. So, so for an existing landfill that is going to reach back to the old rules, what, what exactly are they going to be in compliance with? Because there actually, in fact, are no rules currently for permit by rule. They, those rules are still basically in place. What the changes did was to add new regulations and new rules that must be met by inert landfill. So basically these rules are not changing the old rules, they're adding additional rules. And, and the additional rules were not in place when these others were permitted. I, I, you know, as I said yesterday, this is, and a lot of these landfills are uh, small cities, counties that are operating in a correct manner. Um, and to send them an unfunded mandate to spend uh, more taxpayer money to ensure that they come up to compliance with new rules, 
seems to me to be a little unfair at this time. We we don't like it when the federal government sends us unfunded mandates. I don't think these uh, county and city governments would, would like it either. W would you yield for another question? Certainly. Uh, the gentleman from EPD who testified yesterday said that the old rules were no longer extant and that they would have to actually write entirely new rules to put permit by rule back into the EPD rules. So uh, unless, unless he was mistaken, it seems to me that there actually are no rules by permit that one could look back to in order to determine compliance. Yeah, then I would suggest if the House passes this, and, and that was his feeling, that they put the new rules, I mean the old rules, back in place. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, we have one of our committee members today not present. Um, Representative Tom McCall's father passed away just recently, so um, he did have a huge issue that um, in his absence, can you explain how you dealt with, with that for us? Certainly, that is the, um, that's on line 23, 24 and 25, which simply says that any landfill receiving only inert waste and which has a total capacity of 250 cubic yards or less shall be exempt from all permitting requirements. And, and this was, as we mentioned, and I, I believe Representative Buckner brought in, into play yesterday too, in an agricultural society there are times when our, our landowners must, uh, you know, bury a, a stump, push a stump over. And, and as the uh, representative of the department uh, said yesterday, that would be illegal under current regulation. So that, that was added to, to give our agricultural community a little leeway and how they operate their own operations. Thank you. Are there any further questions? J yes, uh, just push your button, please. Um, excuse me for just missing the first part of your presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Person. Um, and I appreciate the uh, breaking down the categories of um, landfills, but I still don't have in my graphs what in earth, what is that, what is exactly does that mean? Well, the inert sure. landfill allows only inert materials, uh, supposedly, but actually it allows yard waste. Yard waste are not inert. They do produce methane gas, and that is the problem that the EPD is trying to, to uh, face with this. So, but that's, that's the two things. You can have inert materials and yard waste in an inert landfill. Just say gentleman yield. And With gentleman yield first. Yes. Um, I, I'm still trying to get a grasp on inert. I mean, I know solid waste. I know construction demolition. But inert, give me an example of what would be in that landfill. Like, would well, it be like a, co concrete. Uh, okay. You know, you, you tear down a, or tear up a road, gravel, concrete. Okay. That's, that's totally inert. Okay. Uh, and, and But then the yard waste was other. Okay. Um, does the general yield further? Certainly. Okay, uh, on line um, 23, 24, 25, mm -hmm. it said that the people would be um, exempt if it's at least 100 feet from any property line or exposed structure. So let me ask you this. What, what, um, what was the reason for 100 feet versus another uh, amount of that, that feet away? That was the, the request of the EPD. Okay. that be added 100 feet. That is the now the buffer uh, that is required on, on inert landfills. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I, um, I see no more questions. So, Chair will entertain the motion. Push your button, please. All right, number 29. Yes, Madam Chair. I uh, make a motion to do pass um, House Bill 320, uh, the committee substitute. Thank you. Second. All right, any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, nay. I'm sorry, I was talking while y'all were saying it. So go ahead and your, the nays. Thank you. Um, you have a due pass, Representative Harden. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, committee. And um, we're now ready for Representative Randy Nix's bill. Thank you, Representative Nix. Thank you, Madam Chair. Bring to you uh, House Bill 226. And uh, 
this bill is designed to go straight to the source of the the tire dumping problem in Georgia uh, <clears throat> by updating Georgia's current EPD uh, the rules and giving EB EPD uh, a little bit better tools to deal with it. Um, my I, real quickly, some of my history on this is some of you know I got involved with trying to to work on the scrap tire. Uh, problem a couple of years ago when I carried a bill that uh, renewed the uh, scrap tire fee, the $1 uh, solid waste trust fund uh, fee. Uh, and I promised at that time that I was going to try to do everything I could to, to address the problem. And we've been working on that. There was a, actually a news conference yesterday where the Georgia uh, GDOT has approved and will begin using the uh, scrap tires in the asphalt, which is a big, big deal to uh, uh, to be able to use those because that uses up a lot of those uh, those scrap tires. Uh, what we're trying to do here is to address this at the source rather than waiting until they get out there in those piles or they get dumped on the back lot. Uh, this idea is to try to uh, to address that up front and, and keep them from getting out there in the first place. Um, our, our EPD director made a statement the other day that I wrote down and I knew I was going to use it. I'm going to use it here. He said the ROI, the return on investment, is much greater in our upfront efforts to stop a problem than having to go clean it up because cleanup is extremely expensive. So uh, that's really what we're trying to do. Uh, the bill will talk about scrap tires versus used tires. Uh, as it stands right now, if someone is hauling a load of tires, uh, if they're hauling scrap tires, they have to be permitted. Uh, but if they call them used tires, then they they got a free pass. There, there's nothing that can be done. And what's happening is the, the bad actors are going out there and, and usually in the middle of the night going back behind the, the tire place, they're getting 25, 30 tires, uh, and they're calling them scrap tires if they get stopped, but then they may use 10 of them that are, are truly used tires that can be reused, but guess where the rest of them go? They go on the back lot somewhere. They go in the ditch. They go somewhere else. So, so that's really what we're trying to... Uh, to look at um, and we'll go through the bill but I want you to know that we worked very closely with the tire dealers uh, and the recyclers uh, and EPD to try to come up with this and the whole idea is to try to find those bad actors that are, that are doing these things and get them out uh, we had testimony from uh, 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 Toby Sexton with the tire dealers from Steve Levitan with the auto recyclers and uh, Dewey Grantham from the tire recyclers Liberty Tire uh, in support of the bill if you will look at it real quickly, we'll go through it. This is um, LC 400300S. Um, in Section 1, uh, lines 16 through uh, 22, uh, really 16 through um, uh, 20, EPD asked us while we were doing this to update the definition of compost and composting to bring it up to the national standard. So we have done that. That language was... Uh, was asked for, and we uh, we did that at the request of EPD. Doesn't have doesn't have anything to do with our scrap tires. But uh, if you look down on, on uh, line 24, uh, tire carrier means any person engaged in collecting or transporting tires other than new tires. Here again, this is to bring in those people that are that are calling them um, used tires rather than uh, than scrap tires. Uh, then on line 26, top of page two. We talk about tire retailers. Uh, we put in a, a, a definition there, other than a used motor vehicle parts dealer licensed in accordance with a different chapter, so we've, 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 we've not put them as part of tire retailers. Line 29, we define used tire, and we're using the, the definition that really comes from EPD's rules and regulations now. Uh, it talks about a minimum of two-thirds inch of, of road tread, uh, and then it is still suitable for its original purpose, but is no longer new. And as you know, uh, there are a lot of people out there who, for whatever reason, may go back in and, uh, and have their tires changed early because they want a different brand or something. But this just gives a basic definition uh, of what a used tire is. Uh, and it states very clearly that a used tire shall not be considered solid waste. Uh, so that, that further restricts what they can do with them. On uh, line 38, uh, here again, we're, we're going and we add the word it had uh, disposal of scrap tires and then to expand that definition and the collection inventory marketing of used tires, again, to bring that in. 
On line 46, the code section that's marked out there has actually been repealed. I think it may have been found unconstitutional. I can't remember, but that was kind of a cleanup that that is no longer uh, out there. One of the key components of the bill uh, on, in Section 4 is to allow local uh, law enforcement to enforce um, these, these rules. As it is now, EPD is the one who has to enforce it. Uh, this is modeled after the City of Atlanta's ordinance that they did this year uh, to address this. Theirs is even more strict than what we're doing for a statewide person, for, for statewide purposes. But they're going to allow the, their, their um, code enforcement people to deal with this. And we'll talk about it in just a minute, but the key to this is going to be a decal that the, the haulers will have to have on their vehicles to show that they are authorized to, uh, to carry uh, the tires that are either, either scrapped or used. On uh, page uh, four, uh, beginning at the top, uh, again, we bring in um, any tires other than new tires to, here again, to bring in the, the used tires in, in, in scrap. Um, and, and then we get into this talking about the, the uh, permit, uh, line 100. They must obtain a tire carrier permit issued by the division uh, and display on each vehic vehicle used to collect or transport tires a decal issued by the division. Uh, and the only exception that we're listing right there is a common carrier that collects tires outside of the state and brings them in directly to a scrap tire processor or an end user. And the reason that we did that is they are regulated by the PSC and they would have the uh, appropriate documentation uh, as to where they got the tires, where they were going with the tires, et cetera. Uh, then as we, as we work our way on down again, we, we work in, uh, we, we take out the word scrap and, and expand that definition. Line 113 is where we come to the decal. Pay to the division a nominal fee for each decal issue. Uh, and that was the, that is the way we would, would define these. Now, we, we talked about that, and very few, the, the, the people who would be hauling the tires, the legitimate haulers, uh, this, they, they said this was fine with them. They have no problem whatsoever uh, because they get hurt by the bad actors, uh, and they're willing to do this um, and, and pay the fee to have that decal. And then uh, 114, uh, no person shall process scrap tires, and, and we include in this the processing of scrap tires, too. Uh, for purposes of this subsection, the term process scrap tires means any method, system, or other treatment designed to change the physical form, size, or chemical content of scrap tires for beneficial use. We go down to line uh, 121. A private individual transporting no more than 10 of the individual's own uh, tires. Uh, we, we went around and around with that number. Uh, we had four. Um, and we said, well, you know, you got a car, it's got four tires, and if you change them, you're moving them around, then somebody said, what if you got a dually? Well, that takes it to six. So we just said, okay, you got a dually, and your wife's car's got four tires, so we'll make ten. And, and surely nobody legitimate sh should be running around out there with, with more than that is in their use, their personal tires. Um, so, so we did that, and there's also another reason for that we'll, we'll touch on a little bit later, but we did not want to uh, harm those people who may be out cleaning up the neighborhood. They may go out and, and pick up tires and do that. We've actually got a provision for them in Section uh, 5 here. But uh, uh, that's, that's the reason for limiting that, uh, uh, having that number there. On uh, 127, a tire retailer transporting its own used tires, uh, if the dealer can provide proof of purchase with receipt, which they, they could, and a, and a document verifying the origin, route, and destination of such tires. Here again, that's just to make sure that, that it's not somebody who's picked up a bunch of tires. They're going to use just a few of them and dump them. We want to know that, that they're taking them to the right place. Then at the top of page 5, uh, line 130, we're excluding any person transporting tires collected as part of an organized site cleanup activity. There was a big concern that we did not want to stop that. That, of course, is extremely important. Uh, and we discussed that in... in, in pretty good detail uh, with the fact that those will be known activities in a community uh, when that is occurring. Uh, it probably will not occur at 11 or 12 o'clock at night when uh, the bad actors are out there moving around. Uh, on line 146, we, we go down and we're limiting the number of scrap tires that people can have uh, anywhere in the state uh, to 25. 
uh, storing 25, we cut that number down from 100. And then we've got some exceptions here, a solid waste disposal site permitted by the division. Uh, on line two, a tire retailer with not more than 1,500 scrap tires rather than 3,000. This was agreed to by the, by the, uh, the industry. They said that there's really no reason for them to have that many. Uh, this just reduces the, the opportunity for those tires to get out there. On line 152, we raised the number for the tire retreaders. And we talked about that. The, the reason for raising that number, uh, those people have both incoming and outgoing uh, uh, tires. And when I say incoming, of course, they're taking the tires that have been, uh, have been taken off to be retreaded. But, but they have them going out the other side because they have uh, some of the cases that they were going to use, their, they have to reject. So we actually raised their number. Then on line 154, uh, we, we put, instead of an auto salvage yard, we, a licensed used motor vehicle parts dealer uh, with not more than 500 scrap tires. The number didn't change, it's just the definition. And then uh, 158 through 162, and this is critically important. These people who are allowed to have those tires will be required to have them in a locked enclosure. Uh, or otherwise adequately secured in a manner suitable to prevent un unauthorized access. Here again, that's where uh, they, they take the tires off, they put them out back of the business, they leave it open and those tires tend to walk off somehow in the middle of the night. But we were concerned about the small business that this may be a, a real economic hardship on the very small dealer. And we put in a provision uh, that the division may waive the grant a waiver of the enclosure uh, if they can show that it's a significant and unique economic hardship which would impair their ability to stay in business. Uh, and the uh, EPD felt like that they could do that uh, without any problem. And, and the last thing we wanted to do is hurt a legitimate uh, business there. The rest of the language there, we just carry through to, to get to the, the other part of the section. On page uh, 234, we, uh, on line 234, we talk about a surety bond. Um, that uh, a, a tire carrier uh, or scrap tire processor um, uh, has to have. And then on page uh, 8, on line 241, we define that surety bond. Uh, in the past, it had been not to exceed 25000 We changed that to it shall be not be less than ten nor greater than 20000 The reason for that was... In the past, if they were hauling, I believe, 500 or fewer tires in a month, that they would only had to have a $5,000 bond. So most people coming in, no matter what they were hauling, that's what they said they were hauling, so they got that smaller amount. But in reality, uh, the, the problems that those create are, are much greater than what $5,000 would cover. So what they're going to do is they say, if, you, if, you, if you're hauling at all, you've got to have 10, and then the maximum you would have to have is 20. Uh, the, the cost of, of cleanup is, is more than that lower number that they had before, so that would give them a, a range that they would, uh, would be able to work in. Again, the, the department would oversee. And then finally, uh, on line 262, we update the date. This updates the uh, EP and improves EPD's actions, but it limits them going forward because this says that what they've done up to that time they could do, and we still approve what they do going forward. So, Madam Chair, that is, uh, that is the bill the, and hopefully stated the purpose, and uh, I, I would certainly entertain questions. Thank you. You do have a few questions. Um, number 26. Thank you. Um, when I was uh, county manager, we had a big issue with this in our county, and we uh, created several avenues. At, at our transfer station, we started taking tires from the public to drop them off, charged a very nominal fee for that. We also had a couple of days a year people could bring them at no charge. And then we also had work crews that went out and picked them up. My, my question is, though, and I know a lot of counties do this, we hauled our own tires down to the recycling facility. And I just want to make sure, I, I wasn't sure in the language of the bill, would it still allow counties and cities who operate transfer stations to be able to transfer these tires, or would they have to also obtain a permit from EPD uh, to do that? I believe that they're already qualified to. Uh, they're already already qualified to haul them, if I'm not mistaken. That that's part of their uh, their authority. We may have somebody from EPD that could handle that. I don't. I don't know the, the answer. Could I see if we have somebody who can answer that? Saw someone earlier. It's EPD. Do you have oh, okay. 
All right, you need to give your name. You're not from EPD, so go ahead and give us your name and your. I'm Dewey Grantham with Liberty Tire Recycling. The uh, answer, I have an old version, but it's um, on mine it's 125. An exemption applies for the United States of America, the state of Georgia, any county, municipality, or public authority. So you okay. would be allowed to haul those tires. It's, it's on line 132. Uh, he has the pre thing, so. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I, I thought it was in there, but I couldn't put my finger on it. Thank you. Um, I, th I think our next number is number 17. Uh, please give your name again. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Josh Clark. Uh, Chairman Nix, thank you for bringing this bill. I'm sorry I missed the uh, subcommittee that uh, you presented it to. I had another committee at the same time. This would have just been a rerun for you. So. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, it looks like it's about the same. Um, do have a couple questions for you. Um, what is, I keep I heard the nominal fee being somebody suggested maybe eight dollars, but I, I mean we don't. That's well, subject to change, correct? Yeah, we we talked about that. We talked about some numbers. Uh, we had had said okay, flat ten dollar fee. Uh, the the department said you know it could be less, and it could be more. This is not anything but for them to be able to cover their costs to do it, so they can identify these folks. It's not a money maker. Nominal would would limit that. We had reasonable for a while. But we felt like nominal was even more restrictive, so it's not a money maker for them. It would be to cover their cost. At this point in time, I think they said if they had to put a number on it, it would probably be around ten bucks. So it's not a uh, it's not a big number. Madam Chair, may I yes. have another question? Mm -hmm. um, before I ask the, the next question, I, I want to just put it in context. I do appreciate what you're doing, and every year I get out with my kids and we go clean up scrap tires and trash, and I think it's something that's good to ingrained in them at an early age to be responsible and I know that's what you're trying to achieve with this bill and I, and I appreciate that. Um, you know just some of my concern is serving on small business and job creation. I know you had the same concerns of trying to limit uh, rules and regs on small businesses. I have several small tire shops, very small used tire shops in my district so um, again just trying to think about that but how do you enforce um, 102 through 104 the, the the decal, I understand, is supposed to help you be able to enforce you know, who's hauling tires and they're not hauling them out to dump them, as I understand. But how do you enforce whether or not they're, somebody tells the officer, well, I'm bringing it from out of state and I'm you know, carrying it to an end user? Um, it seems to me like there's a few ways that I could, I, you know, I seem to think, and I guess that's my question, is how, how do you stop them from getting around this even though we're charging these fees and we're, the people who are complying are doing their job, but... Isn't there ways to get around this? I'm sure if somebody really wants to get around it, they can probably figure out a way, but this would be a, a way. Are you talking about the common carrier? or uh, Through 102, lines 102 through 104, says the paragraph shall not apply as far as having a decal to a common carrier that collects tires exclusively from outside the state and transports them directly to a scrap tire yeah. processor or end user. They, they would have to have paperwork showing where it originated the route and where it goes that's that would be by the uh, public service commission's rule on common carriers uh, okay so okay. if you got a if you got a guy with his um, uh, with it with his his uh, cattle trailer loaded up with tires coming in he probably would not be able to to get by with this they would have he would not have what what they need in order to to accomplish that okay thank you thank you um next number is number 25 again give your name Frank. thank you madam chair chuck williams uh again represented next chairman next thank you for taking this task on and, and i was at the subcommittee meeting but sleep was hard to come by last night so i stayed up reading bills again and i've got a couple of questions that i did not have in subcommittee uh sort of related to uh representative clark's question just thinking about uh when this bill is signed in the law the the challenges for law enforcement and and this maybe is, is getting a little bit of detail but um, on the the decal for the permitting uh, if a tire carrier is is is, is pulling is running a, a pickup truck or a flatbed truck pulling a trailer would law enforcement uh, expect that individual to have decals on both of those units or just on one of those units it, it would be my thought that it would be on the the pulling you know on the you know the you, not on the trailer but on the uh, on the truck itself okay. now that we've got some EPD people here I hadn't hadn't thought about that particular issue but I I would think that the the, the truck that's used to pull the trailer would be the one because that would be the 
that would be the responsible person sitting in there. Am I am I right on that? Does anybody from EPD have a have a thought? Or am I wrong on that? I, let's let's. I assume that I'm right on that. Again, just offered in the spirit of trying to make life as simple as possible for the law enforcement officer on the side of the road having to make that judgment call. Madam Chair, I do have I think a related question. Uh, right. If the gentleman will yield. Yes, thank you. Uh, on line 100, where it talks about obtaining a a tire carrier permit that is for uh, a person collecting or transporting tires over on line uh, 134 it talks about a person who generates scrap tires uh, on line 135 that they shall request the issuance of an identification number I'm just trying to figure out if someone basically is generating and transporting tires is that going to be basically one permitting process that they go through for the decal and this ID number, or is it going to be separate processes that they will have to go through if they're both generating and transporting, if that makes any sense? I, I believe now that, that, it, that if, they're, if they're generating, they, or if they're hauling now, they have to have a scrap tire permit. So I don't think this changes anything for them. I think it's a one permit thing because we're talking about the hauling, the moving uh, of the tires with the decal. Okay, all right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Number 24. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Representative Nix, I'll apologize, as I did earlier, for not being in the subcommittee. I'm on the different subcommittee, and this one has gotten by me. But <clears throat> this looks like very well thought through legislation related to uh, tires. My issue goes back to 16 through 20. Could you help me understand why that's included in this piece of legislation? Certainly. The, when, when you do a bill such as this and you open up certain sections, you, you very seldom do that. So the department said, while, you're, while you've got that part of the code open, would you please update our definition related to composting composting that brings it up to National Council standards? Uh, it's my understanding this, this is to, uh, to help them deal with some issues that they've had where uh, you've got extreme smells coming out of some of these places and some of those type things. So this brings it up so it gets them to a posture where they can deal better with that on a, on a uniform basis. Well, I, know that, you, I, I know the department is aware more than the committee, and that's my fault, of my specific issue, and, and they didn't clue me in on this. So this is the first time you see it, and I'm really concerned because I do have the biggest problem with this in the entire state. And I, when I see the, the odor-free part omitted, that is the big issue, and maybe it's because I'm not a lawyer. I'm from the country, and I'm just kind of used to straight, you know, straight talk. So, I just wanted to get some more clarification on that. Maybe I can talk with the department directly, and they can make me more comfortable. I, I would, I would not think that this would be anything detrimental to your situation. I think it would probably make them ha let them have a better ability to handle that situation. Would be my interpretation, and and this was something like I said that w was not part of my original thought to do this, but. Uh, to help them get it up to where they felt like they needed the, it to be to enforce the, the rules. Yeah, well, I, I want to develop that same level of confidence in the department. Thank okay. you. Thank you. And um, this is our last question, number 17. Thank you, Madam Chair. How much is the penalty for not having the decal or not complying with these? I'm still still learning, so bear with me. What? I, think I know that's that in another would, section, but... Yeah. I, I don't know what the, the penalties, the enforcement penalties are. Does, is anybody from EPD here that could, could help with this? Or Dewey, do you have an idea? Uh, we have, uh, I see Jer Judge Turner. I think you've been here all along. Camouflaged very well <laughs> back there. <laughs> Just thank you. Madam Chair, good, good to be with you this morning. I was stepping in just to see how this was going, so I wouldn't need, the, the question was on fees. Yeah, no, the question was if, uh, what are, what are the penalties if, for people who do not have the decals? How would we? How, how, what do we I'll do have that? to get. I'll have to get an answer for the committee on that. I, I don't. Unless Russ, do you have? I'll have to get back to you, representative, okay. on that. Thank you. I, Thank I don't you. think that these would be out of line with what what they have now. What, what they're doing is just trying to to get these people who are get, skirting the rules. Uh, and, and to bring in the, the used tire people, it's not to expand that, uh, to, to change to change the penalties or whatever, but just to bring in those the bad actors that are now able to get past it. 
Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I see no further questions. Um, Chair will entertain a motion. Um, your number is 27. 20, 27. Okay. Madam Chairman, I do uh, make a motion that we do, do pass for House Bill 226. Is there a second? second. All right. Any further discussion? I see two buttons pushed. Was that for the motion? Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, all right. I see no further discuss discussion. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Those opposed, nay. Um, thank you very much. You have your bill. Thank Representative you. Nix and to our committee, please always check the bulletin board outside. To those listening, we try and update you as quickly as we can with changes. We're now getting to the busy part of our session, so it behooves you to keep a constant eye on it. Thank you very much. Stand adjourned.